All right, first things first, um, and what we're going to do tonight is we're going to continue on with this kind of the research topic. Uh, one thing that we skipped over when we were in Chapter 5 and 6 was the Uniform Bank Performance Report. Uh, she, she made reference to this tonight, and so I thought it'd be a good time to go in, show you how to pull a UBPR on a bank that you might want to research, but specifically what it's telling you, because when you, when you pull a UBPR, if you print one out, it's kind of overwhelming because you've got 34 to 37 pages of just solid numbers staring at you. So I thought I would kind of go through in general and tell you what you're looking at in case you decide to do that. Um, and then what we will do next week is we will start on chapter seven, okay? Now, the reason that I'm holding off on this is because it's gonna help a lot if you will print out the slides from chapter seven. Uh, and so you can find those here, so if you go down to chapter 7 of PowerPoint. Now what you'll notice is there's, uh, this is the student version, you'll notice this has a background, you'll probably want to clear the background from, uh, from this. <clears throat> I doubt you want to use all the ink to uh, to print this, this, uh, this tan background. <clears throat> But again, what you might want to do, again, there's 49 slides here. So go in, clear the background, print these out, because this is, at least when we go through it, you're going to think it's pretty technical information. So it's going to be a lot easier if you've got that in front of you when we start going through asset liability management than trying to write all of this down. There's some tables here. There's some um, big numerical tables that I'm going to be using to explain things. And so instead of trying to remember what it said, just print it out, bring it to class with you, and that'll make life a lot easier for you. Okay, I promise. Now, um, all right. What did you think about last week's test? I mean, was it, was it different than what you expected? Was it, um, was information on the test not covered on the, on the study guide? Did you not study enough? Did you study too much? Do what? Okay, now the app, the test was a 77 point something, I believe, which was in a point, uh, within one point of the previous year's test average and was within 75 basis points of the test average from two years ago. So it's not like it was a lot different for you than any of the other classes. Um, what I tried to make you aware of was even though the material and sometimes, you know, when I'm up here going through the material, my job is to make it seem somewhat simple, but it may not be quite as simple as that when you're studying and you're preparing for a test and you're actually taking a test. Uh, and so I try, to, I try to make you aware of that. The grades were pretty good. I mean, there weren't any fantastic grades. The highest grade in the class was a 90, but there weren't any just really terrible grades either. Everybody was just kind of in that 80s, 70s area, upper 60s, kind of that area. Now, the thing about this is, remember, we have four tests in here. You can drop your lowest test grade. So if you messed up on test one and you're thinking, you know, wow, that, was just, that just wasn't my test, I didn't study enough. I was at the, I had to take care of my friend all who was sick the night before and I didn't get a chance to study or whatever it might be. Of course, you have the option of taking the comprehensive final. I will also tell you that test number two, uh, and I'm just going ahead and kind of, you know this, test number two doesn't get much easier. 
okay, in terms of the content. I will tell you test number three does get easier. So you can make up some really valuable points on test number three. It's kind of your, your gift from me for surviving the first two tests in here, okay? And if you look at the material, it's not that I make the material hard. I mean, I'm not trying to. It's just the material is different than what a lot of you have seen. And so that's what I told you the, from the very beginning of the class is that in banking, a lot of the terminology is different. The balance sheet and income statement look a little bit different than what you've been used to looking at for the last two or three years. And so, it's, I mean, that's just the nature of the course. But it does get better as you become more familiar with the, with the topics, with the, the concepts. It's going to make more sense to you. But the reason that we need to learn what we're doing in here is because if any of you take Finance 537, which is actually a pretty fun class because there are actually no tests in Finance 537, is you, we have a bank simulation is one thing we do in there where you're actually making decisions on how to run a bank uh, in a team environment. So you'll have three or four people on your team. Well, if you don't understand balance sheets or income statements or ratios or what we're going to cover in Chapter 7, which is asset, li asset liability management and what effects do interest rates increase or decreasing have on your profitability or your bank's value, then you're not going to perform very well when it comes to running a bank. And even though you can't, I mean, it's not the real thing, it's pretty realistic in terms of setting interest rates. What are you going to charge on loans? different types of loans. What are you going to pay on deposits? How much are you going to pay your employees? Are you going to give them a bonus? How much are you going to reinvest in securities each quarter? Are you going to focus on that? Are you going to focus on your loan portfolio? Are you going to try to make your bank bigger? Are you going to try to make your bank smaller? All of this has to do with what we're covering this semester in, in this class. Because when you make it through this, 537 is a breeze compared to this. Okay, it's one of those classes where you just kind of kick back, relax, have fun, listen to the speakers that I bring in. I mean, it's, it's a great class, okay? But you've got to make it through here, and all of you are doing, you're doing okay, so don't worry about that. I just um, I wanted to just make you aware that keep plugging away. You're doing fine. You're not doing any worse than anybody else, any other classes for the last three years. And so you can still make a very, very good grade in this class. And of course, you always have, if you want to take it, the comprehensive final that will replace your lowest test grade if you score higher than your lowest test grade. Okay, I just really don't want to see anybody having to do that unless you just want to. Okay, because it, it just tends to be a difficult test. Are there, are there questions about, about the test itself? Any parts of it? Next test will be the same. Multiple choice. Um, for chapter seven, I think the next test covers three chapters maybe, three or four. Now, what we're gonna do is we will <coughs> The last test material for test three, we can actually cover that if we need to in one class meeting, okay? Now, it will be a long class, but we could cover all the material because it covers parts of different chapters, okay? Typically, I'll take about two class periods to do that. But so as we go along with chapter seven next week, and then we just keep going through, I think your spring break is the following week, and then you come back. And so as we're getting close to the end of the semester, a lot of times students will contact me and they'll say, hey, you said we're going to have three tests plus the comprehensive final in here if we choose to take it, and we're running out of time in the semester. Are we going to be able to finish? Well, the answer is yes, we will, okay? I mean, that's just how it works out every semester. And so that's why I've got test three set up like it is. So once we get through the two big tests, test three, and again, don't underestimate it, but you can score really, really well on it if you just spend a little time on the material, okay? All right, so other questions? 
Also, let me remind you that um, advising will be coming up pretty soon. Those of you who need to come talk to me, please try to set up an appointment in advance. Um, we come by and discuss what classes you still have to take. Any of you that may be graduating in May of 2018, if you are interested in the commercial bank management option, um, let me uh, encourage you to come by and see me. We can sit down, see what classes are left to take. You're taking this class this semester, which is all, all finance majors take it. In the fall, Finance 537 will be offered. That's one of the classes you have to take for the commercial bank management option. Uh, that's going to be a night class. It's typically a Tuesday night class. Uh, and then there's some other classes that you have to take for that option, uh, and we could get those worked out. So you know what to take in the fall, what to take in the, in the spring semester of 2018. Is an elective for a master's course, 537? That's the class you're talking about? Currently, no. Okay. We, at one time, we did do that. And so I'd have a few MBA students and mostly undergraduate students. And then they went away from the 500 level classes. And now they're kind of going back to them in the combination 500, 600 level classes. So to answer your question, at this point, no. But if I can get that changed, I will. Okay. Because I think it does benefit some of the, the MBA students. And typically the difference is the MBA students, they're supposed to have some type of additional work requirement. And so normally they have a research paper in that class that the undergraduate students don't have to do. Don't, or don't have to do. But other than that, it's the same class. Okay, but right now it is not open to MBA students. All right, other, other questions? How many of you were able to go to the banquet last Wednesday night? Here the speaker. Did anybody have any questions about that, about it, the, any of the speakers, um, any of that? Why did they not want to give their opinion? Yeah. <clears throat> that's, a, that's a good question. They, they were probably, well, one reason is they don't know. I mean, the one reason is we've got so much uncertainty right now in terms of the banking industry. Now, it, it, it's positive uncertainty, but they're going to be cutting back regulations. They're not really sure what they're going to be cutting. You've got some agencies that are, for example, the uh, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau may disappear completely or they're going to take a lot of the teeth away from it. So that's really not going to be doing a lot. And then also they have to be sort of careful because they don't want to lead bankers. You know, they don't want to make a prediction of this is what's going to happen. And then let's say regarding interest rates, for example, and then a banker goes back and they mold their investment portfolio or their loan portfolio into a portfolio that's going to make a lot of money if interest rates do increase four times in 2017. And then interest rates don't increase four times in 2017 because nobody really knows what the Fed's going to do. The bank loses money and then they come back on the Federal Reserve and say, hey, I went to listen to one of your speakers and they said this was going to happen and it didn't. So that's one reason that they really, they try to stay as neutral as possible as they're, as they're talking about different items, especially things that, that we don't know that's going, that's going to happen yet. So you'll notice a lot of their their talk is about things that have already happened, okay, and why it happened, that type of thing. So you, you do have, kind of have to be careful with that. All right, now let's, um, if you go to, okay, now this is back in chapter five and chapter six. And so, and again, I skipped through this. <clears throat> again, we're, not, we're just going to go over this pretty quickly. I mentioned something called the UBPR, and this um, is <clears throat> created by the FFIC. This stands for the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council. So essentially what this is, these are all the examine agencies, the Comptroller of the Currency, the FDIC, the Federal Reserve, and the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau all together, and they go in and they've got this one document, the UBPR, the Uniform Bank Performance Report. 
These numbers are pulled from what's called a call report. And all banks have to file a call report every quarter. So every three months, a bank has to fill out a call report. It is a very intimidating document that covers all aspects of a bank. So the FFIC takes that information, they put it into somewhat of a readable format, although it's still pretty complicated. And basically what it looks at, it looks at all different areas. For example, liquidity, capital, earnings, and other factors that could either help or damage your bank. And you've got the data presented as ratios, percentages, and dollar amounts. Okay, and so this is one of the main things that you need to kind of figure out when you're looking at a UBPR is simply, what am I looking at? I'm looking at a page of numbers. Are these percentages? Are they dollar amounts? You know, what, how does this help me? And so as we take a look at this, there's other information too besides the basic uh, UBPR report. You can pull, for example, a peer group average report, uh, a state average report, a list of banks in a peer group, and we'll talk about the peer groups in just a minute. Um, or you can do a custom peer group if you don't like the one that the UBPR places your bank in because sometimes the parameters are pretty large. So for example, you may be placed, if you've got a $500 million bank, you may be placed in a peer group of banks between $300 million and a $1 billion. Well, that's a pretty wide parameter. And so you may want to you know, shrink that down some uh, and make it a little more pertinent to your institution. Now, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm just going to go, go to the website and go through and do all of what this is saying. But if you decide you want to pull one of these, this is the step-by-step -step process of how do I obtain a UBPR for a specific bank. And this is really going to be helpful if you decide you want to research maybe a bank that's located in your hometown. I would suggest if you're doing that, talk to the bank itself, talk to some of the bankers, um, find out about the background, the history of the bank, and then you can find your five years worth of data here on the UBPR by just making a couple of changes. And this is gonna continue to walk you through here, then you can view it, and if you want to, you can print it. And again, as I'm, I think I mentioned this to you, but what you wanna do is you want to <clears throat> change to, and I've got this in red in all caps, you want to change your printer or, or your computer printout to landscape format before you print it. Otherwise, you're going to have 40 pages of wasted paper and you're going to have to go back and print it again because all five years of data will not fit on portrait uh, printing. All right, so let me, let's see. So I'm going to go here Let me get out of this. And I'm going to Okay, so I just go to the FFIC.gov website. And I understand this is kind of hard, it's really hard to see. Okay, if you promise me you'll stay awake for the next few minutes, I'll turn the lights off so that we can actually see this. And it's still going to be hard to read. But when you go here, I mean, there's a ton of information here, okay? So you can see down the left-hand side. I mean, there's just so much information. Um, some of you talked about maybe doing it on uh, cyber security, that type of thing. I mean, here's some information here. And there's examiner information, consumer uh, information, that type of thing. Now, as you go down and if you take a look, now on the right-hand side, too, there's a lot of information. And what we're looking for is this, okay, UBPR. Now, if you want to look at the user's guide, let me go ahead and warn you, it's pretty helpful, but it's huge, okay, because it explains a lot of the ratios, it explains a lot of what goes into this 34 pages, and so it is a massive, massive user's guide. But if we click on UBPR, it's gonna take us down here, now what we're looking for is here, the UBPR report. Now you can see some of the other information that you can obtain here, but I'm just gonna click on uh, the UBPR report. It's gonna take me to a page. And 
So we've got information here. Now you can search for a bank a couple of different ways. One is you can use a unique identifier such as um, an FDIC certificate number. It's easier just to use the bank name, okay? So I'm gonna go here. I want to select, uh, out of all of these options, I wanna select a Uniform Bank Performance Report. I'm going to put the institution name. Now, I typically the bank that I use because it's just I've asked for their permission to use it in, in class, even though it's public information, and they never had an issue with it. So I typically use uh, CFSB because it's a fairly big bank. It's a well-run bank. They've got really good ratios, and so that's the one that I typically use whenever I'm teaching at different banking schools around the country. So I'm going to type in just. That may be enough, actually. And then I'm going to type in Benton. It's headquartered in Benton, Kentucky. And that will probably be enough for me to search for this thing. All right, so you will notice here, it pulled Community Financial Services Bank, CFSB. So I've got that information. Now, you'll notice the standard format is going to give you five periods of data, but the standard format is year in 2016, September 30th, 2016, June, March, and then December 31st, 2015. Okay, that's not what we want. We want the last five years worth of data. So you can do this any way you want, okay, if you're doing some type of custom report. But the easiest way to do this for five years of data is simply click on custom. And then we're going to go through and choose the information that we need. So I need 1231-2016. I need 1231-2015. I need 1231-2014. I need 1231-2013. And year in 2012. Okay, so there's my five years worth of data. And now I'm going to click here. Now, the reason that I go through this is because even though this is a really nice website and there's a ton of data here, it's not that intuitive in terms of you go down the page, then you have to go back up the page, then you go down the page and back up. It's not laid out extremely well in terms of just working your way through the process. So if I click on generate report, uh, let's see if this will come up anyway. <clears throat> All right, let's try this again. All right, so this is what your first page is going to look like. Now, Notice to the left, I'm going to try to explain this as, as simply as possible. On the left, you have your various pages that are found within the UVPR. So your cover page, your summary ratios page, and I can tell you, I mean, this is going to be one of the most important pages that you use here, the summary ratios. It gives you information about the bank at the top of the page. So, for example, this is the FDIC certificate number, number 287. It currently does not have an OCC charter number. CFSB, um, may, that may be changing so that they would be uh, under an OCC charter. You can see the county where it's headquartered. Now this is not every county where it has branches, just where it's headquartered. Here is the name, and then you've got the, the latest report here. Now as you go down the page, you can see some information on the introduction. You can see the Address of the bank. It shows you when the bank was established. So this bank has been around since January 1st of 1890. So apparently they're doing something right uh, to be around that long. The current peer group for this group is peer group number three. Okay, what does that mean? Well, that means that this is insured commercial banks. That means FDIC insurance having assets between $300 million and $1 billion. That's a really large number of banks. 
and then it will show you if we go to the next page. Now you can click on this, uh, and it'll take give you some more information on it, but it'll show us on the next page how many banks are in that peer group. And it's going to be a lot of different banks. Okay? So if I want to go through, now this on the right, this is going to give you the table of contents, so it's going to match up some somewhat with what's over here. Okay, this is how you find the information. This is what's on the various pages. And actually, I included that here. Okay, so this would match up with the summary um, or the table of contents. The only thing that might be changed, and I haven't looked this year, is occasionally the FFIEC will go in and change the name of one of these topics. So that would be the only difference between these and what you see here. All right, so I'm going to go here. I'm going to go to the summary ratios page. Well, actually, let me go to the cover page. Actually, I was just say, let's go here. Okay, so I'm going to go to summary ratios. It's going to think for a minute. It's going to bring this up. Now, they are nice enough to separate these into the yellow and blue columns to help us somewhat keep the numbers straight. But as you can see, this is a page full of numbers. And this is where most people look at this, and they just sort of have sort of a meltdown in terms of what is this telling me? I mean, I've got all of these numbers, page after page after page. But the important thing to look at is going to be up here at the top. Okay? Now, it's going to tell you, first of all, this is the, there's summary ratios and page one. Okay? So that's our starting point. It's then going to tell you that these are earnings and profitability as a percent of average assets. Now, that matches up with a lot of what we did when we calculated ratios, because we calculated ratios instead of average assets, we used a lot of them as a percentage of total assets. So what you'll notice is, as you go down through here, for example, interest income divided by average assets is, for this bank, 4.54%. And that's going to match closely with one of the ratios that we calculated if you take a look at this, this is going to give you the peer group three, which this bank is in. Peer group three has an average of 3.94%, and our bank, CFSB, is within the 86th or 5th percentile. 86th percentile. Now, somebody explain to me, what does that mean when we're talking about percentile? So what does this mean for CFSB? That is interest income, and the TE here stands for tax equivalent because sometimes they have municipal securities which aren't taxable. What does that mean if you're in the 86th percentile? Okay, I'm staring at a group, a class full of finance majors who I know understand what a percentile is. Okay, that means that your interest income as a percentage of average assets is better than 86% of the banks within your peer group, in this case, peer group three. So with some of these, now it's important to know that with some of these, you want to be in a really high percentile. Others, you want to be in a low percentile. It kind of depends on you know what we're talking about. And then we can just work our way down. For example, interest expense. This bank has a 0.86%. So less than 1% interest expense. Uh, the average group, or average bank in the peer group is in the 40th percentile. So this shows you are in the 95th, 96th percentile. For this one, you would want to be in a low percentile because what this is saying is you're paying over twice as much for deposits as the average bank in your peer group. Now, there may be a perfectly good explanation for that. But right now, you're paying a lot, so you have a really high interest expense as compared to everybody else in your peer group. And then you can just keep going down. So you can see net interest income as a percentage of average assets, non-interest income, non-interest expense. Um, 
you've got your provision for loan losses. Notice, I mean, they're at four one hundred of a percent compared to uh, twelve one hundreds for the peer. So again, that's a good number because you're in a low percentile. That's where you want to be for your allow. Uh, excuse me, for your provision. And we work our way down to net income. So this is the return on assets. We calculate the ROA. So this bank has a 1.17 ROA. The average bank in your peer group has a 1.06 ROA. So you're in the 65th percentile, which is probably pretty good, although you would probably want it as high as possible. Now, what you can do is you can go back and you can make a time series comparison of what's been happening with this bank over the last five years. And you can analyze the ratios. You can go down here to margin analysis. And you can see, for example, here, the average earning assets to average assets, um, interest bearing funds to average assets. Now, notice some of these are different because all of these are as a percentage of average assets. Some of these are average, as a percentage of average earning assets. And what was the definition that we used of an earning asset for a bank? Any asset that generates what? Interest income, okay? So any asset that generates interest income, primarily loans and investments, is an earning asset. And so here we've got this as a percentage of, of earning asset. We've got just basic information. Remember, this is a summary page, so this is not gonna take you real in depth, but it's gonna give you some information on loans and leases. It's gonna give you some information on liquidity, on capitalization, um, and growth rate. And then down here at the bottom, you've got the average total assets for the year. You've got the total equity capital. These are in dollars. And then the net income. So all of these are in dollars. Okay, so that is the summary page. You can look at the income statement. The income statement is in dollars. So these are the last five years. And again, Okay, so we shift from percentages to dollar amount. So this is the income statement. Interest of fees on loans, we work down to, to interest income. We've got interest expense. We have non-interest expense, uh, non-interest income, which is here. And it's gonna take us all the way down to net income. And then you'll notice for this particular bank, it has net income. Now these are in thousands, so you would add three zeros to this. So this bank in 2016 made $10,472,000. This shows us how they divided up between dividends declared versus retained earnings, and they decided to put all of it back into retained earnings. The reason being that this bank is employee owned. Okay, it hasn't. ESOP, an employee stock ownership plan, and so it's, it has basically employee ownership, and so that's what they're doing by plowing the money back in. You'll notice they've done this each year. So it's not that they're not paying it out in terms of to their shareholders, it's just that they're putting it back into the bank, and then it's gonna be distributed out through the ESOP to the employees when they retire. All right, so that's the income statement. Um, you can work your way down here. Now, this is some non-interest income information. This is the balance sheet, off-balance sheet items. And again, some of these aren't going to be pertinent to this bank. For example, if we go to derivative instruments, you're going to notice a lot of zeros here. It's because uh, this bank simply doesn't deal very often in derivative instruments. Normally, you have to get to a larger, more sophisticated bank uh, for this, or sometimes the bank's just not, they're sophisticated enough, they're just not interested in dealing with this. Once we go there, we've got derivative analysis, we've got a balance sheet as a percentage, and you can just go down. You can take a really close look at the non-accruals of the loan, concentrations, excuse me, of credit, interest rate risk, which is what we're gonna be talking about in chapter seven, liquidity, uh, capital analysis, the income statement uh, in chapter nine, I think it is, we're gonna talk about the securitization process and selling loans.
and so that would be pertinent here although you're probably not going to see much here okay so that's yeah that's a pretty good guess so mostly zeros you might see some down here one to family uh, one to four family residential loans okay but again just a lot of information then this these last two these are uh, fiduciary services so this would be if a bank has a trust department which this bank does not have a trust department thus you see all the pages of not applicable so when you when you look at this and you think wow there's a lot of information here keep in mind that some of these pages aren't going to have any information on it so don't be so overwhelmed by this this is a fantastic way to research any bank that is operating in the united states well let me take that back any bank that is headquartered and operating in the united states so if you want to research the murray bank cfsb or a lot of banks that aren't they're publicly held but they're typically owned by a small group of investors. A lot of times for most corporations, it's really hard to find out anything on the financials of those types of corporations. With a bank, it has to provide the call report every three months. And so you can research these banks and you can find out a ton of information about how good they are or how uh, maybe how bad they are. So are there any questions about the Uniform Bank Performance Report, obtaining one of these, finding information, that type of thing. We could go back, let me go back here really quickly. Let me click on this. Okay, so what I did, I clicked on the peer groups that are in this, that are found. You'll notice the number of banks in this peer group. There's 1,223 banks in peer group three. Now, we know this is, there's only about 4,500 banks operating in the United States. So this is a big peer group, and it may not mean a lot to you. So what you might want to do is go in and create a custom peer group that's a little more pertinent to your bank in its asset size. But you, again, you can see the banks listed here. They're going to be listed, and you can, you can sort these however you want to. They're listed by, in alphabetical order by state. So you've got some banks in Alaska. Banks in Alaska probably don't have a lot with banks operating in Marshall County, Kentucky. I could be wrong, but I mean, that's just a guess. Um, you've got some banks operating. So what I would do if I were going to do a peer group is I might form a peer group for banks operating in the southeast and south uh, and midwestern states that would be between possibly 700 million and a billion dollars that would give you a better peer group and a better way to measure your bank's performance against your competition than something like this where you just have so many banks operating so you can see the average asset size over here i mean here's a bank that's you know three hundred and sixty thousand dollars in assets it may or may not have a lot to do with uh, a lot in common with uh, CFSP. And again, you can just keep going through the different pages. All right, so. You could do that also. What I would do, like I said, I would probably try to create my own custom peer group. So you don't have 1,200 banks here. And you know if you could get it down to maybe 100 to 150, maybe 200 banks, compared to the bank that you're researching, that's going to give you a lot better look into how is this bank performing versus 1,200 banks. But again, it's going to depend on, you know if you're researching another bank, you may be in a different, your bank may be in a different peer group. And so, you're not even going to be concerned with peer group three. You may be looking at either larger or smaller banks. For example, um, let's see. Well, I don't think I'm going to be able to come up with one that's 
too much smaller than that. Okay, I'd have to start over, so I'm not gonna worry about that. But, I mean, again, some banks are small. You know, you may be researching a 20 or $30 million bank. That's a really small bank, but that may be the bank that's in your hometown. You may, be, you may want to research a regional bank like Regions Bank or BB&T or um, U.S. Bank. Or you may want to research a huge bank, Citibank, for example. I mean, that's completely up to you. That's why I left the topics so open is because I want you to research something that interests you. Because if it interests you, you're going to do a better job than if it's just something that I tell you to research. So if anybody, if you have questions about this, let me... Let me ask you, please, please, please don't wait until the last week before this is due to pick a topic and start researching your paper, okay? Try to start as early as possible. So if you have questions about potential topics, the suitability of topics, um, what I typically see is when you choose a topic, you actually choose one that's too large. You know, you'll come to me and say, hey, I'm thinking about writing on this. Well, remember, it's an eight to 10 page paper. And so you have to have a topic that fits within eight to 10 pages of writing, not including the cover sheet or the reference section or anything else. So keep that in mind. All right, so are there any questions for those of you still awake? Okay, for those of you, I'm going to answer his question here, but that's all we're doing tonight, okay? Print out Chapter 7 slides for next week. Next week, we're going to jump into some heavy-duty number crunching, okay? So everybody have a great week. Be safe, and I'll see you back here next week.